بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد فقد قال جل وعلا في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عسى الله أن يجعل بينكم وبين الذين عاديتم منهم مودة والله قدير والله غفور رحيم وقال النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم اللهم لا عيش إلا عيش الآخرة فاغفر الأنصار والمهاجرة أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Honorable scholars, respected brothers, elders, mothers and sisters it is a basic fact of life that nothing can be obtained in this material world without payment. There is a price to every article, there is a price to every item. Whether cash or kind, one has to pay. Logically speaking, every buyer wants to give less and secure more. And if perchance it's reversed, he has to give more and receives less, then this constitutes loss, failure, and misfortune. And often in the commercial circles, we hear people say, I burnt my hands never again. It is rather tragic and unfortunate that we do not apply the same theory, phenomena, and principle when it comes to the aspect of sin, transgression, and vice. By Allah, in whose control is my life, the price a sinner pays to sustain one son, whether it's an illicit relation, or a gambling addiction, or a substance abuse, it is far greater than the supposed pleasure he receives. The first price every sinner pays the first price every sinner pays without exception he has to bid farewell to happiness from his life permanently and let me not mince my words there will be a thrill in his life when he pops the pill there will be an excitement in his life when he's online chatting with a strange woman there will be a kick in his life when he's pulling the machines and gamblings. But bliss and happiness will be unheard of in his life. Depression and misery is synonymous to the sinner. Depression and misery is synonymous to the sinner. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the great giant, the great scholar, the second Umar, who once again revived justice in the world. He one day seen his son on the day of Eid. And his son was clad with a simple garb. While the general youth were clad in exclusive, beautiful new dress. So as a father, as much as he wanted to discipline his son, for a moment he felt that my son might be marginalized, he might be victimized, he might be isolated. People would look at him, he's the only boy wearing old clothes. So the dad was moved by the simple garb of his son into tears. So the son engages his dad. And he says, Ma yubikika ya abi. Oh my dad, what makes you cry? It's a topic of its own to reflect and introspect on how profound the interaction of the pious was between father and son versus the common dialogue of father and son today. 
by and large an average young man today considers his father to be an ATM machine. Put your card in and draw money that you want. That's all. So Amr ibn As radiallahu to digress but to expound on this sentiments. He is in the throes of death. He is the conqueror of Egypt. When we went to Egypt with the grace of Allah, we went to the masjid. We visited the grave. He's in the throes of death, a critical moment, a sensitive moment. He slips into a coma. After a little while, he gains consciousness. He slips into a coma. He gains consciousness. His son, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Asr was present. He nudges his father. He says, Dad, the moment is sensitive. The time is critical. You're about to bid farewell. You're on the verge of taking your last breath. I don't wish to be insensitive to your trauma. But once you pass away, you'll be gone permanently. Who will ever tell me the agony of death? If I'm not asking too much of you while you're dying, can you relate your pain so that I can reflect? Ya abati sifli al maut. What were the pious? In the agony of death, in the throes of death, the son engages his dad. Dad, tell me what, it, what does it feel like? فَلَوْلَا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ حِينَ إِذٍ تَنْظُرُونَ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْكُمْ وَلَكِنْ لَا تُبْصِرُونَ فَلَوْلَا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ غَيْرَ مَدِينِينَ تَرْجِعُونَهَا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ فَلَوْلَا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُونَ Why not when the soul reaches the collarbone? And we are closer to the dying person than you are. But you see us not. If you claim there's no retribution, and if you claim there's no repercussion, and if you claim there's no consequences post death, then here's a dying man who halt his soul. Halt his soul. Tarji'unaha, return it. In kuntum sadiqeen, if you are honest in your claim. Fa'amma in kana min al-muqarrabin. Farawhun wa rayhanun. Farawhun wa rayhanun. If he's amongst the noble, for him is fragrance, for him is sustenance, for him is mercy. So the son asked the dad, Dad, tell me what does the agony of death feel like? So the father says to the son, that is why one scholar was asked, why don't you speak on contemporary issues? He said, can there be something more contemporary than death? Can there be something more contemporary than death? Oh my son, it appears to me, as if the mountains of the entire world are exclusively resting on my chest. Oh my son, it appears to me as if the mountains, bearing in mind the jungles and the forests of the world, what an intellectually stimulating discussion pre-death. You and I don't have the ability to speak on that level in our senses, while we're conscious and focused, you're slipping away from this world. These were people who valued their time. That is why I often say, when people are sitting and relaxing, they say, we're killing time. You're not killing time, my brother. Time is killing you. The clock is ticking and time is killing. I was here a year ago. Has a year lapsed? Has a year passed? Has the wheel turned? Is it 12 months down? My words, my word. Oh, my Lord, soon will the day come when I will be lying before you and the angel of death will knock my door. And then he slips into a coma again. There is a prolonged silence. The son holds his breath in. He's concerned about the agony of his father. 
but he wishes that his father could kindly complete that sentence. He gains consciousness. Dad, my apologies. I sympathize with your trauma. You were telling me you feel like as if the mountains of the entire world on your chest. Could you be kind enough to complete that sentence? And I feel as if I'm trying to breathe from the eye of a needle. And I feel as if I'm trying to get a breath from the eye of a needle. And he slips into his agony, never to stand up and go on permanently. And what were his last words? Allahumma la qawiyun fa antasir. وَلَا بَرِيٌّ فَأَعْتَذِرْ وَلَا مُسْتَنْكِرٌ بَلْ مُسْتَغْفِرٌ اللهم إنك عمرتنا فعصينا ونهيتنا فمن تهينا ولا يسعنا إلا عفوك He has this dialogue with his son. He then lifts his hands. He said, Oh my Lord, you've instructed me in my life to do many. Unfortunately, I did not comply. You prohibited me. Tragically, I did not restrain. Oh my Lord, I don't have a defense. I don't have an argument. I concede guilt. I admit all wrong. Allahumma la qawiyun fa antasir. I'm not strong that I'm going to challenge the angel of death. I'm going to engage him. I'm going to refute him. Wala mustankirun. And I don't refute any of my crimes. Bal mustaghfirun. My hands are down. I apologize and concede. Saying these words, he left the world. May Allah make that discussion a reality for us. Say Ameen, brothers. That becomes the topic at home. That becomes the atmosphere at home. That becomes the dialogue at home. Remember a child who excels in academics and he has multiple A symbols? That's merely a reflection that he has committed to memory the work that has been imparted to him. That doesn't make him an A in the eyes of Allah. That only is an indication of his skills to commit to memory. What if the information imparted was atheism, which he committed to memory? Do you still refer to him as an A student? He's, he's, he's committed it to memory, that's about it. Does that make him great and excel? We'll have to critically analyze the material that has been imparted. And yes, if he has imbibed that, and coupled with imbibing it, does he practically execute it? then perhaps we could elevate him to the pedestal of an ensemble. But let's not be blown away by the achievements and the merits of our children by merely memorizing anything. So Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahmatullah sees his son on the day of Eid and he's clad in a simple garb and he tears. So the son tells the dad, Ma yubkik. Dad, what makes you cry? He said, Akhsha an yankasira qalbuk yawm al Eidi." My son, I'm going to feel so hurt when each of the youngsters will be walking around in society clad in exclusive garb, wearing an affluent dress, and then their dads will look at them. There will be a tear of joy. There will be a spark of excitement. There will be a moment of happiness only to know you're the only youngster that is wearing simple and ordinary clothes. I just hope you don't fall prey to depression and you don't fall prey to isolation, and you're not marginalized by the youth. The young boy of that time had greater sanity than the elders of today. He said, Dad, since when depression was for the man who wore old clothes? And since when happiness was for the man who wore new clothes, by Allah in whose control is my life, depression and misery is inseparable from the man who disobeys Allah. Depression and misery is inseparable from the man who disobeys Allah. When Umar ibn Abdul Aziz heard this, he was moved to tears. He kissed him between his eyes. He said, my son, no son has ever made his father proud as you have made me with this statement of yours. Thumma, if you have raised children like this, you're a father. That is why in English they say, fortunate is he whose children run into his arms even when his hands are empty. If my child runs into my arms when they have money, then what's so great about it? 
even the Karuns and the Fir'auns of their time, the tyrants and the dictators and the autocrats of their time, those who brought tyranny on this earth, those who massacred, those who were butchers. But yes, not only did the biological children of my Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but even the Sahaba run into his arms when his hands were empty. You are a father, my brother, if you've successfully crossed this hurdle and got your children into your arms without monetary temptation. Fudail ibn Ayyad rahmatullah alayhi used to say, Inni la a'asillah, inni la a'asillah, fa ara thalika fi khuluqi imra'ati wa khadimati wa himari. When I disobey Allah, I instantly notice the temperament of my wife changing, the behavior of my servant, nay, I also observe my conveyance rebelling against me. What did Fudail ibn Ayyad rahmatullah say? When I disobey Allah, I instantly see my wife's temperament changing. You abuse your sight at work and you come home and you wonder what's happening here at home. Fudail ibn Ayyad has given you the formula and the reason. He said, when I disobey Allah, I see my wife's temperament change immediately. I see, you know, one brother told me, he said, Whenever a person is hostile or unpleasant to me, then I tell myself he's not a bad man. He's a good person who had a bad day. He's a good man who had a bad day. So I said, brother, but will that philosophy work in marriage? Because you're going to have to say this often. She's a good woman who had a bad day. She's a very good woman, but she's having multiple bad days. How does it work in the marriage environment? He said, Sheikh, you got me thinking. I say, I think up an answer, then we can have an extension to that theory. The point that has been emphasized here, misery is inseparable to the one who disobeys Allah. That's the price. Ibn Qudama rahmatullah has made mention of an incident in Kitab al-Tawwabin. Very, very brilliant incident. Very, very brilliant. There was a person by the name of Mahdi who lived the life of sin, vice, evil, womanizing, a very fleshy and flamboyant lifestyle. He would indulge in every crime you would think of. He would perpetrate every offense you've heard of. He gets and is having a night with women and wine, and he omits his Zahar prayer, his Asr prayer, his Maghrib prayer, and the sun sets and it gets close to Isha. So his slave girl has a sense of concern. And she says to herself that I've got to do something to open the eyes of my master. So she devises a plan and she gets a flame, a live coal burning flame. And she comes and she burns the leg of her master. Fanzaja immediately gives him a shock and he stands up and he said, Ma'adihi, what is this? So she said, Jamratum min nari dunya, fakayfa tasna'u bin nari al akhira. Jamratum min nari dunya, fakayfa tasna'u bin nari al akhira. This is but a flame of this world. Heaven alone knows what would happen to you when the flames of hell are hurled towards you. Inna ha tarmi bi shararin kal qasri, ka anna hu jimalatun sofr. إنها ترمي بشرر كالقصر كأنه جمالة صفر. Verily, hell will hurl sparks towards you the size of palaces. It hit home. He realized the time has come, and he has to draw the line, and he needs to change his priorities. He then decided to abandon a life of sin and embrace a life of simplicity. Motivated by the consciousness of Allah, and he devoted his life. Once two prominent scholars came to visit him, namely Fudail ibn Ayyad and Sufyan ibn Uyayna, who enjoyed the privilege of being referred to as the Muhaddith of the Haram of Makkah. 
So he came to visit him and he seen the man was had downgraded, living a simple life, hand to mouth, breaking even, gave up all the fleshy, all the exclusive, all the affluent lifestyle, did away with all the fancy things of life. So Fudayl ibn Ayat and Sufyan ibn Uyayna engaged him and said, listen, إِنَّهُ لَمْ يَدَعْ أَحَدٌ لِلَّهِ شَيْئًا إِلَّا عَوَّذَهُ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا مِّنْهُ فَمَا عَوَّذَكَ مِمَّا تَرَكْتَ لَهُ It has been the system of Allah that whenever anyone forsakes anything for the pleasure of Allah, then Allah always replaces it with something better. You have given up your sinful life. What has Allah given you back? This is the system of Allah and there's no exception. In lieu of what you've done, what has Allah given you? He said, Arrida bima anafihi. I lived a sinful, affluent life, but wallah, I was the most miserable, depressed person you've ever met. I've now given up that sinful, affluent life, and I've embraced a compliant, simple life, and I'm the most happy person you have ever met in your life. What has Allah substituted it? And hence I said, a person in sin will have a thrill. He'll get a thrill. When he pops the pill, he will be high. When he chats with that girl, he'll get an excitement. When he pulls the machines and he gambles, he will have a buzz and a kick. That's what Samiri said. I felt like doing it for the thrill, for the feel, for the excitement, for the kick, to explore, to find out. So that would happen. But we're not mincing our words here. We're not talking of that moment of excitement or the moment of thrill. We are talking of wholesome bliss. We are talking of inner joy, and that is subject to compliance to the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in nothing else has Allah kept that, in nothing else. Now let me take that theory forward, let me take that theory forward. Ibn Jawzi rahmatullah the great scholar, in many of his writings, and in particular in Rawdatul Muhibbin, which is the kitab of reference that I would touch on in my presentation today, he's dedicated a chapter to this year, Man taraka lillahi shay'an, Whoever will forsake something for the pleasure of Allah, it is the promise of Allah that Allah will replace something better for him. That's it. Then he cites multiple examples to give a practical dimension to this theory. A. كما ترك سيدنا يوسف عليه السلام امرأة العزيز واختار السجن على الفاحشة فعوضه الله أن مكنه في الأرض يتبوأ منها حيث يشاء. سيدنا يوسف عليه السلام did not succumb to the provocation and the seductive temptation of a prominent beautiful woman. He resisted temptation. Allah rewarded him. Allah rewarded him. He was imprisoned initially. He persevered and endured. And in relation to his perseverance and his steadfastness, what did Allah give him? Allah gave him authority over the entire dominion of Egypt. So he says, Fata'amal, reflect. Remember my opening sentiments. If only we could apply the theory of benefit versus harm when it comes to sin. If I'm going to sin, what's going to happen to me? What are the long-term consequences? The immediate benefit versus the long harm. And I will tell you, by Allah, the most exorbitant prices are not as expensive as sin is. I often say to a young man, you go to a shop to buy a simple article, but there is a woman there, the chances of which are you going to fall prey to the zina of the eyes. And perhaps at a distance, there is another shop where the same article will cost you double the price, but there is no fear of any sin. By Allah, walk the extra, pay the extra. I swear by Allah, in whose control is my life, you've paid less. I swear by Allah, in whose control is my life, you spared less. Why? You return from that shop with your Allah, and you return from the first shop without your Allah. لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ إِذَا فَارَقْتَهُ عِوَضٌ وَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ إِنْ فَارَقْتَهُ مِنْ عِوَضِي The Arabic poet said, if you lost anything, I can arrange for a replacement. But oh boy, oh boy, 
if you've lost your Allah, I have no substitutes to help you with. Life is a challenge between desires and the suppression of desires. At times my heart agonizes me, at times I agonize my heart. Life is a challenge between desires and the suppression of desires. At times my heart agonizes me, at times I agonize my heart. So anyway, Sayyidina Yusuf resisted temptation. Allah gave him the empire of Egypt. What does he say? فَتَأَمَّلْ كَيْفَ جَزَاهُ اللَّهُ عَلَى ذِيقِ السِّجْنِ أَنْ مَكَّنَهُ فِي الْأَرْضِ Look, he persevered. The imprisonment of a jail. What, what did he hold back? What Allah gave him? The dominion of Egypt. From the narrow confines of a cell to the vast empire of Egypt. يَتَبَوَّأُ مِنْهَا حَيْثُ يَشَاءُ نُصِيبُ بِرَحْمَتِنَا مَنْ نَشَاءُ وَلَا نُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ We favor whomsoever we want and we will not allow the good of the pious to go unrewarded. Furthermore, Ibn Jawzi writes, وَأَقَرَّتِ الْمَرْأَةُ وَالنِّسْوَةُ بِبَرَاءَتِهِ وَأَذَلَّ لَهُ الْعَزِيزِ Allah then subjugates that minister whose wife seduced Yusuf at the feet of Yusuf. He comes begging for an apology. The very woman under discussion concedes guilt. The general woman of Egypt testify his innocence. وَهَذِهِ سُنَّتُهُ تَعَالَى حَدِيثًا وَقَدِيمًا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ And Ibn Jawzi writes, this is the untempered system of Allah. This is the unadulterated pattern of Allah that whosoever, whenever will forsake something for the pleasure of Allah, he's promised to come back home with a more handsome return. You never walk out with less. And this remains till Qiyamah. So Abu Talib one day told the Prophet ﷺ, his beloved uncle, مَا أَرَى رَبَّكْ إِلَّا يُطِيعُكْ Oh my uncle, I, oh my nephew, I see your Allah is very passionate to obey you. Abu Talib said to Prophet ﷺ, and what did the Prophet ﷺ say? وَأَنْتَ يَا عَمْ لَوْ أَتَعْتَهُ أَطَعَكْ Oh my uncle, you obey my Allah and he'll obey you. Oh my uncle, this is not only for me, you obey my Allah and he will obey you. Unfortunately, we've tried everything, but we haven't tried bonding with our Allah. We've tested all theories, but we have not tried the ecstasy of the bond of Allah. Furthermore, Ibn Jawzi rahmatullahi writes, وَلَمَّا عَقَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ بْنُ دَاوُودَ الْخَيْلَ الَّتِي شَغَلَتْهُ عَنْ صَلَاةِ الْعَصْرِ حَتَّى غَابَتِ الشَّمْسُ سَخَّرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ الْرِيحِ يَسِيرُ عَلَى مَتَنِهَا حَيْثُ أَرَادُ When Sulaiman ibn Dawood, when Sulaiman ibn Dawood alayhi salatu was salam slaughtered the horses which had become a hindrance in one order of Allah and with the variation of narrations either his asr got delayed or was made qada. There is difference of opinion. And those horses he was preparing to engage in battle not for a personal motive but he realized engagement in one was becoming a hindrance in a, hindrance in a more supreme command. He said, I don't want to benefit and I don't want to soil my hands and taint my reputation and blemish my income and dilute my money with that animal which has become an obstacle in the obedience of Allah. Slaughter those animals and distribute it amongst the poor. I'm better off with an animal and its monetary return than that animal which has become an obstacle in the obedience of Allah. When he did that, Allah gave him the exclusive miracle of the wind being at his command. No other Nabi had this honor. That is why one of my scholars used to say, fly. Sulaiman Airways, Sulaiman.com. Sulaiman Sulaiman had the exclusive domain over the winds. Sulaiman Sulaiman 
وأسلنا له عين القطر ومن الجن من يعمل بين يديه بإذن ربه ومن يزغ منهم عن أمرنا نذقه من عذاب السعير يعملون له ما يشاء من محاريب وتماثيل وجفان وجفان كالجواب وقدور الراسيات يعملوا آل داود شكرا وقليل من عبادي الشكور ولسليمان الريح and we made this, the wind subservient for Suleiman غدوها شهر ورواحها شهر he comfortably covered the distance which would be covered in a month on a camelback or horseback with a swift conveyance in one morning. وَرَوَاحُهَا شَهَرْ And in the afternoon. To which land? إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا The land that we had blessed. And that was Sham. The point is, what's the point, brother? He parted with something for the pleasure of Allah. He came home with the winds. He came home with the winds. As the immediate benefit, Allah alone knows what Allah will give him in Akhirah. The reward of goodness is in Akhirah. This is just the, the things of this world. وَلَمَّا تَرَكَ الْمُهَاجِرُونَ دِيَارَهُمْ لِلَّهِ وَأَوْطَانَهُمْ أَلَّتِي هِيَ أَحَبُّ شَيْءٍ إِلَيْهِمْ عَاذَهُمُ اللَّهُ أَنْ فَتَحَ عَلَيْهِمْ الدُّنْيَا وَمَلَّكَهُمْ شَرْقَ الْأَرْضِ وَغَرْبَهَا When the muhajireen had forsaken their native land, Mecca, on the command of Allah because of the hostility of the infidels, and they were compelled to journey beyond, and they had to leave their native land, and they came to Medina, and it's not easy to climatize, it's not easy to adapt. And remember today with all luxuries, with all ease, you can Google it, you can go on, on, online, you can do everything, you can transfer your funds, you can establish yourself there, you can have an economic muscle here, you can have a base there, you can have a home there. So many things, yet you yearn back for home. This was leaving Mecca knowing not what the future was ahead. They made this migration and they, forced, they, they were prepared to forsake their native land أعاذهم الله أن فتح عليهم الدنيا وملكهم شرق الأرض وغربها In lieu of them leaving their native land Allah opened up the east and the west of the entire world to their feet They became the rulers of the continents And where and where they took the deen of Allah وكذلك السارق لو ترك سرقة المال Likewise, a thief, if he stops his theft, Allah will give him that same money through halal. He will have the same and Allah will be pleased with him. Likewise, if a man indulging in zina, abstains and restrains, Allah will give him that same woman or something better. Allah will give him the same woman or something better through lawful and legitimate means. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu narrates it. He ﷺ said, نَضْرُ الرَّجُلْ نَضْرُ الرَّجُلْ فِي مَحَاسِنِ الْمَرْأَةِ سَهْمٌ مِّنْ سِهَامِ إِبْلِيسِ To glance at the beauty of a woman is an arrow from the poisonous arrows of the devil. مَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذَلِكَ السَّهْمِ he who restrains and abstains from this poisonous arrow of the devil, Allah. Look at the words of the hadith. If you study this word, if you do some etymology of this word, if you dissect it and you analyze it, what's the root words? Allah will follow, Allah will replace, Allah will return. With what? He will be amongst those fortunate individuals who will enjoy an ecstasy while obeying Allah. A spiritual ecstasy. My brother, the thrill is not to talk to an illicit woman. By Allah, a man in sin, he is excited for the moment and for the 23 hours, he's a restless individual. He will sleep when others are awake. He will be awake when others are sleeping. He will be sitting in his house with his wife and children, the best of amenities and luxuries, the best of homes and abodes, but he will be devoid of happiness 
This will be the consequences of sin. May Allah let my eyes open today. May Allah let your eyes open. This is the harsh reality. One youngster says, I read in one kitab, he says, I was walking by night. My gaze fell on a strange woman. Suddenly I seen myself drawn towards her. I tried to lure her and invite her. And it was a bright night. The stars were shining upon us. And I said to her, Ma yarana illa al-kawakib. Ma yarana illa al-kawakib. It's a bright night. It's only the stars that are shining upon us. Come close to me. We could perhaps indulge and enjoy. And we could satisfy our fantasies. What an answer came from that girl. She said, Fa'ayna mukawkibuha. Fa'ayna mukawkibuha. You say the only the stars, we are only exposed to the stars. What about the creator of the stars? Are we not exposed to him as well? Falamma janna alayhi al-laylu ra'a kawkaba. Qala hadha rabbi. Falamma afala qala la uhibbu al-afileen. The stars will disappear, appear and disappear. But the creator of the stars, you cannot veil him, he never disappears. صاحب الشهوة عبد إذا غلب الشهوة أضحى ملكا Here we have a conflict of definition. And let me say something at this juncture. We join the world in the slogan of empowering and liberating women. But we differ grossly in the definition of empowering. We join the slogans of liberating women. We are in harmony with those sentiments. But we, we differ grossly. Our definition of liberating a woman is not enslaving her for material gain. We beg to differ. Our definition of a slave, the poet en encapsulates it, captures it in these couplets. He said, the one who lives a life governed by his whims and his ego, has shackled himself by his own doings. The day he musters the courage to overpower his ego, proportionately he will unshackle himself with his own doings. So has not our cell phones literally become a cell of a jail? Has it not become a literal? That's why one person said, what's the definition of a cell phone? I said, tell me. He said, instant torment. We're having a good social discussion, and the man disappears, and his mood changes, and he's gone, and this could happen with roaming. It happens abroad also. Why these, these gadgets are governing my life? And I'm made to believe that, you know what? I'm on time. I'm moving it up. Ibn Jawzi rahmatullahi goes on to say, and I hope, I hope, I cry to Allah and I always beg Allah before I start my talk, that oh my Allah, let me say those words that touch my heart, that make me come close to you, my creator. Make my friends and the general ummah come close to you, my Allah. Let, let, it, let it open our eyes. We are living in trying times, my brother. We are living in trying times. Amir ibn Abdullah al-Tamimi radiyallahu anhu, a tabi'i, what he used to say, he used to say, Allahumma, innaka khalaqtani bi amrik, wa aqamtani fi balaya hadihi dunya bi mashi'atik, thumma qulta li istamsik, walakin kayfa astamsiku illam tumsikni bi lutfika ya qawiyu ya mateen. Oh my Allah, you created me because you decided to do so. Then you subjected me to the trials of this world and you put me in an error that you had decreed in which I had no choice. Then you impressed upon me to exercise restraint and caution. I only ask you politely, how can I achieve this if you don't hold my hand? I only politely ask you, my Allah, in this ungodly environment where I barely exit from here and there's a billboard to invite me. And there's an SMS to tempt me. And there's a seductive nature to seduce me. And there's no fabric to the community and no fiber to the society. And the junior have no regard for the seniors. And it's a world driven by lust coupled by monetary gain. And there's butchers and massacres. And what and what is happening, my Allah? Sometimes when I read the quotations of the pious predecessors, 
I have a feeling that their words were not so opportune at the time that they said it as they are today. I said and wonder, I said, Ya Allah, this man said it when he said it, but these words of his are more relevant today than that day. Imam Shafi said, Lam yabqa fin nasi illa al makru wal malaku shawkun idha lamasu zahrun idha ramaku. In his prayer, he said, Oh my Allah, there's nothing left in this world but deception and delusion, oh my Allah. There's only hypocrisy and smoke screen in my Allah. When I look from a distance, these humans look like blossoming flowers. But my Allah, when I get close, I see every one of them are thorns and they're ready to prick me. And I think of these words of Imam Shafi. I said, I don't know if they were so relevant in his era as they were today. Are not the people looking like blossoming flowers? But get into business. Get into business with someone. And I'm afraid, my friend, you will run further than you ever ran from any beast. Hosefa ibn Yaman said, I foresee an error coming. Only he will be rescued from the tide of that ocean, from that dark tunnel. The one who begs Allah like how a drowning person begs Allah. يَأْتِي عَلَيْكُمْ زَمَانْ لَا يَنْجُوا أَحَدْ إِلَّا مَنْ يَدْعُوكَ دُعَاءِ الْغَرِيقِ when the internet and modern technology made its first appearance, it was embraced with excitement, coupled with bliss. It has become a global village. We can communicate. Gone are the days of physical address and telegram. We've moved on. We're on Twitter. We're on SMS. We're on email. We're on Skype. We're on this and that. And we've seen how the world became smaller and communication became easy. And I heard of an article and I read about it, a professor in one country and a surgeon in another country and an entire orthopedic procedure was done through SMS communication. Wow, brilliant, meritorious. He who uses technology to his advance, great, we have no issues. But I'm afraid we've come at the crossroads as the Quran says. The Quran does not refute the benefit of gambling, lotteries, people have charitable organizations have been helped. Look at the profoundness of the Quran. مَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِن نَفْعِهِمَا وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِن نَفْعِهِمَا Yes, indeed. Alcohol in moderation has its benefit. Gambling generates some income, but without doubt its evils far more surpass its good. I wonder, but the world has become so driven by monetary that we would admit and confess that technology is now being at a minus at the detriment of our community. It is one of the key reasons of breaking marriages and you can read from mainstream media. You don't have to read from alternative media. But everything is driven by money and wherever we see revenue coming, it will have to continue. So what did Hosefa ibn Yaman say? A time will come None will be rescued. None will be rescued but the one who begs Allah like a drowning man begs Allah. A drowning man? Oh Allah help me, I'm drowning. Rahmatika ya rahman rahimin. Is that how he cries to Allah? No, he cries from the recesses of his heart. He is holding on to a straw. That is why Allah says, I respond to the call of the desperate because it's sincere. My brother, how are you calling your Allah for the salvation of your youth? How are you asking your Allah? Is it a regular five minute prayer? You've got to beg and beseech and implore your Allah. His sovereignty remains intact. He is not threatened by anyone. He is not intimidated by anyone. He is not obligated by anyone. He is not overpowered by anyone. He is not answerable to anyone. So Ibn Jawzi rahmatullahi writes, reflect over this. It's so deep. It's so deep. He says, إِنَّ مُخَالَفَةَ الْهَوَىٰ تُقِيمُ الْعَبْدَ فِي مَقَامٍ مَنْ لَوْ أَقْسَمَ عَلَى اللَّهِ لَأَبَرَّ If you, in harmony with our topic, 
if you have the courage and you can master the power to tame this wild ego, to govern this lustful ego, then it would elevate you to a pedestal, to a platform that when you make a request to Allah, there will be clout and weight and strength in your request. Here comes the point of temptation. Here comes the element of benefit versus harm. He said, when you don't succumb to your ego, for the moment your ego will throw a tantrum, like a child throws a tantrum. That's it. Because you have accustomed it to a particular evil and a vice. So if you were popping a pill, or you were chatting with a woman, or you were playing a machine, or you were indulging in intro, whatever the nature of the crime is, I'm just isolating two, three. Every time that you were dependent on that, you will come to that moment, there will be a moment of restlessness, uneasiness, there will be a crave, there will be a withdrawal symptom, whatever it is. If you resist that, he says, your ego will not get the excitement of the moment, but your ranking with your creator will go up so high that one luxury or one fake pleasure of yours will not be catered for, but a thousand requests of yours will be in, in, immediately honored. A thousand requests of yours will be immediately honored. It's your choice, my brother. It's your call. Either I chat with that girl, and I compromise my bond with my Allah, and then I come home and I lift my hands and there's no strength to my du'as, and there's no clout to my requests, and there's no might to my prayers, and I hold the Kaaba and I do my prayers, but it's not coupled with any strength and might and vigor. Or I resist the temptation, benefit versus harm. Look at the harm of the sin, what it's doing to me. One brother had told me he had a habit of smoking many, many years ago. He said, I vowed to Allah that I want to leave this, and he didn't have children. And he said, Allah, I want children, and I'm asking you, I'm giving up this evil practice, bless me with children. He said, I continued for a few months, we got into a social circle, and here everybody takes out a cigarette, and then I was offered, and obviously my ego went to its provocation at optimum, and then I asked myself, do I want a cigarette or do I want children? Do I want the cigarette or do I want children? My brother, do you want an Allah or do you want a woman? Do you want the happiness of this life, the wholesome nature of a pure wholesome life, that you come home and you don't only share a one roof, but you share a common life, versus the modern day poverty, what I call. What's the modern day poverty? Sharing one roof, living independent lives. So at times you are awakened by the call of nature and two o'clock you go to the toilet or the washroom and you see the light of your son on in his room or the light of your daughter on and you knock the door and you get in. It would have been great. It would have been awesome. It would have been tearing. If you walked in that room and you found your daughter in prostration and you seen your son holding the Quran, but on the reverse, you'll find a haughty youngster, a snobbish young girl, who's got an earphones on her head, playing on the computer, heaven alone knows with which boy she's chatting in which part of the world. Modern day poverty in the heart of affluence, sharing one room, sharing one roof, living distinct lives. The call is yours, my brother. We are at the threshold of Ramadan. I said, what is 15 Shaban? 15 Shaban is a pre-wash. The actual wash happens. You're getting rid of the stubborn stains. And then you do the thorough wash in Ramadan. Here you are, my brother. Here's the call. Then he cites few examples. Sufyan Thawri, a great scholar, a great scholar, who was known for his control over his ego. One day one brother did me a favor. I asked him what I owe you. He said, no, no, don't insult me with money. But I do have a request. I said, okay, what's it? He said, make one prayer for me, a simple dua. I said, okay, what's it? 
Just make dua that Allah give me strength to overpower my ego. I said, the dua is simple. The work is not simple, my brother. That's far from simple. One leg on your ego, the next leg in paradise. That guy said, I'm on my way, all excited. Where are you? I'm getting married to the princess. Wow. Is that true? Yes, I love her. She just has to love me. In that, in that first statement, it's not only you. whole world loves her. You're not the only one that has the exclusive rights of loving her. In fantasy, the whole world is with you. But for her to just love you, dream. Dream, my brother. It's a lifelong challenge. It's a lifelong challenge. At times my heart agonizes me. At times I agonize my heart. Sometimes I get up and I obey my Allah and I win. Sometimes the devil overpowers me. And in the night I beg my Allah to forgive me for what I've done. And I start again. But at least when I start up in the morning, I bow before my creator. Ask yourself, have you ever, have you ever in your life, and you decide what's your age and you know better, started the morning, commenced the break of dawn. Oh my Lord, my agenda for today is I'm not going to disobey you at all. Oh my Allah, can I have one clean day in my life? Oh my Allah, can I have the desire of one clean day in my life? If it doesn't feature as a remote aspiration, when will it become a practical reality? We are getting up with this dream and that dream and this hope and that monetary and what and what it just doesn't end. So anyway, Sufyan Thawri Rahmatullah was sitting in the Kaaba. Abu Jafar Mansur, Abu Jafar Mansur had ordered the execution of Sufyan Thawri rahmatullah alayhi. He said, apprehend him and kill him. His head was in the lap of Fudayl ibn Ayyad. So Fudayl ibn Ayyad said, ittaqillaha wa la tushmit bin al-a'da. There is a warrant of arrest and uh, Abu Jafar has ordered your apprehension and your subsequent assassination. Take measures and be on guard. He was reclining at the Kaaba. He was a man who had mustered the courage to control his lustful soul. So he had a bond that was developing with his Allah. He had a relation that was establishing. So it comes in the narrations. He just leaped forward. And then he held on to the cloth of the Kaaba. And he said, Bari'tu minhu in dakhalaha Abu Ja'far. Allah, I ask you through the agency of the relation that we enjoy for a very long time. Allah, I don't want Abu Jafar to put his foot in Mecca. And oh my Allah, I say to you, I'm not going to settle for anything less. When you read the prayers of the pious, by Allah, you will realize they didn't only supplicate their Allah, they spoke to him. They spoke to him. Oh my Allah, Zakari alayhi salam, inni wahan al azmu minni, washta'al al ra'asu shayba, walam akum bidu'a ika rabbi shakiya, wa inni khiftu al mawali min warai, wa kanatim ra'ati aqira, fahabli min ladun kawaliya. Oh my word, I wish you knew Arabic to comprehend the eloquence and the profoundness. Zakaria supplicates his Allah, the opening verses of Surah Maryam. He's 100 years of age. He doesn't have a child. He says, Oh my Allah, my bones are weak. The time has passed. My hair has given off repeated white strands. But you've never denied and deprived me. And if I don't have a son, I don't see anyone liable that will carry on my mission after my demise. Allah, I'm old, I'm aged, I'm weak, I'm feeble. Time has passed, the moment is gone. But you kind, Do me that favor and confirm that my wife will conceive and I'm going to have a baby. 
And oh my Lord, if you are going to accept my prayer, please make him obedient to you before conception. Let me know he's going to be pious when he's born. I mean, he wasn't praying only. He was talking to his Allah. He was talking. You want to talk to your bank manager? Talk to Allah. Oh my Allah, I'm walking in the street. Oh my Allah, I'm tempted with this woman. My Allah, nobody knows what I'm doing but you. My Allah, I've dropped my gaze. You come, my rebellious son. My Allah, I've dropped my gaze. You bring sanity to my young teenage daughter. Oh my Allah, I've dropped my gaze. You bring piety to my spouse. Oh Allah, I've dropped my gaze. Oh my Allah, you bring wholesome provisions to my house. Oh my Allah, you give me pure income. Oh Allah, you rescue me from my financial crisis, whatever the nature is. Anyway, he dies before he enters Makkah. Ibn Jawzi says, now see. See what it did for him because of his piety. When the moment came, because of the bond that was developed, one prayer, he advanced and he said, Oh Allah, I don't want that man in Makkah and I'm not going to settle for less. Oh, look at those words. Bari'tu minhu in Abu Ja'far. He passes away. Abdurrahman Mahdi Rahmatullah says, I've seen him in a dream. I asked him, how was things? How did you fare before Allah? He said, I was lowered into my grave. And suddenly I appeared before Allah. And then Allah was very kind. My reckoning was simple. I, didn't, I wasn't subjected to intense interrogation. It was basic, what you carry in does that, what you did, etc. Allah overlooked and pardoned. And I was then ushered into paradise. فَبَيْنَمَا أَدُورُ بَيْنَ أَشْجَارِهَا وَأَنْهَارِهَا As I was strolling merrily in the gardens of paradise, إِذْ سَمِعْتُ قَائِلَيْنْ يَقُولْ I hear this unseen voice calling out, Sufyan! I said, yes, yes, that's me, that's me, that's me. And then the voice engages me. Do you know why you are where you are? I'm like, please tell me. I know it's the mercy of my Lord. But do you know which action of yours impressed us? I said, please tell me, my Allah. You were sitting in seclusion one day. There was no human around you. There was no physical eye. In today's time, there was no camera on you. There was nobody watching you. You were tempted with evil. You had the perfect time, the open platform, the equal choice to vent it, to perpetrate it, to cause it, to commit it. But you respected us. You honored us. We respected you. We honored you. Paradise is yours. My young boy, make the calculated choice. My young brother, make the calculated choice. That is why I always say, don't react, respond. Reaction is instinctive and responding is a thought process. When you react, you're instinctive in what you're doing. And when you're instinctive, it could be diluted with emotions. It could be flavored with so many things. But when you respond, more than often you matured, you balance, you calm, you focus, you're objective. That is why Sufyan Thawri used to say, La khayra fi ladhatim min ba'dihan naru. Oh my Allah, what must I do with a woman or a drug, a sin or a vice, the immediate consequences of which is the blazing fire of hell? And Hussein ibn Mutayr rahmatullah alayhi said, وَلَا خَيْرَ فِي لَذَّةٍ لَا تَقْرَبِ الْأَمْرَ الْحَرَامَ فَإِنَّمَا حَلَاوَتُهُ تَفْنَى وَيَبْقَى مَرِيرُهَا What did he say? He said, Do not, do not approach a son because فَإِنَّمَا حَلَاوَتُهَا تَفْنَى إِنَّمَا حَلَاوَتُهَا تَفْنَى its sweetness is the first thing to disappear and its bitterness and regrets never leaves you. Its sweetness is the first thing to disappear and its bitterness never leaves you. The point that I'm saying is sin, its consequences, its repercussion, its evil is permanent. لا تقرب الأمر الحرام 
فَإِنَّمَا حَلَاوَتُهُ تَفْنَا How long is that sweetness? How long is that thrill? And by Allah, after the sin, the depression is greater than before. After the sin, the depression is great. Now, I want to, I want to take one incident and open it up. And that is the incident of Yusuf Alayhi which I brief, briefly touched on. That how he resisted temptation, what Allah gave him back. The point is as follows. Ibn Jawzi Rahmatullah Ali writes it. He says, when Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam was tempted with zina, the dynamics around him were very unique. And hence the reward was equally great. Number one, فَإِنَّهُ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ كَانَ الشَّابًا وَالشَّبَابُ مَرْكَبُ الشَّهْوَةً When Yusuf alayhi salam was tempted with zina, he was a young man. And youth and lust are synonymous. It goes together. A young man in his youth, I don't have to tell you what happens to him. That is why Imam Ahmad Rahmatullah Ali said, حَدَّثْنَا هَيْثَمْ قَالَ حَدَّثْنَا إِسْمَعِيلُ بْنُ عَيَاشْ عَنَ عبد الرحمن بْنِ عَدِي الْبَهْرَانِ عَنْ يَزِيدِ بْنِ مَيْسَرَ أَنَّهُ قَالْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى يَقُولْ أَيُّهَا الشَّاب أَتَّارِكُ شَهْوَتَهُ لِي الْمُتَبَذِّلُ شَبَابَهُ مِنْ أَجْلِي أَنْتَ عِنْدِي كَبَعْضِ مَلَائِكَتِي What did he say? He said, Imam Ahmad said, I heard from Haytham, who said, I heard from Ismail ibn Ayash, who said, I heard from Abdurrahman ibn Adi, who said, I heard from Yazid ibn Maysara, who said that Allah says, O oh, young man in the prime of his life, when his youth is at optimum level, brimming to its maximum, temptations around him, a woman at his disposal, money in his pocket, and then he objectively channels his youth in the obedience of Allah. Allah says to him, Anta indi kaba'zi malaikati. You rank to me equal like how my angels rank to me. You rank to me equal like how my angels rank to me. So number one, Yusuf Ali Sam was a young man. He was a young man. Number two, Kana Azaban. Laysa Indahu Ma Yuawiduhu. He was unmarried. So he didn't have a legitimate alternative. He didn't have a lawful substitute. If a person is tempted with haram, and that's the words of the Prophet ﷺ, then come home for verily your wife has nothing less than the woman outside has to offer. The world outside is calling you outside. Be tempted outside. Look at what is happening outside. That's the unfortunate part. So the husband and wife get chatting. The wife asks the husband, My beloved, if I pass away, would you remarry? She says, no, never. Loyal to you, faithful to the cause. I tied the knot once and that's it. I cannot imagine an intimate moment with another man. Wow, wow. Great, awesome, brilliant. After a little while, there's a twist in the discussion. The wife puts the spotlight on the husband. And how about you, my beloved? If I go... So the wife says, no, no, I won't remarry. I'll stay with my sister. I'll stay with my sister. She's single. I will just pass my life and stay with her. The spotlight is on the husband. What about you if I pass away? Would you remarry? I also won't remarry. I'll just stay with your sister. <laughs> I'll also stay with your sister. That's if he's not already staying. So what does he say? Yusuf والسلام, did not have a halal alternative. He was not married. Which intensified the nature of his challenge. But I must remind you at this juncture, and if you know not, let me seize the opportunity to politely inform you. There have been scholars throughout history who despite not getting married have lived a more bashful life than you and I can possibly love after being married. And I know I'm addressing an audience who follow the teachings and the school and the jurisprudence of the great scholar Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah for whom I have great regard and after all these were our great scholars Ula'ika abai faji'ni bimithlihim ya jariru idha jama'atna al-majami'u The poet said Ula'ika abai these were our forefathers that bring pride to us. 
فَجِئْنَا بِمِثْلِهِمْ يَا جَرِيرُ Oh Jarir, whenever we sit down, talk more about Shafi'i. Talk more about Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Talk more about the pious. These were indeed the great dignitaries of their times. فَجِئْنَا بِمِثْلِهِمْ يَا جَرِيرُ إِذَا جَمَعَتْنَا الْمَجَامِعُ Imam Shafi'i holds the view أَنَّ التَّخَلِّي بِالْأَنَّ الْإِشْتِغَالْ بِالنِّكَاحِ أن التخلي بالعبادة أفضل من الاشتغال بالنكاح. That if a person has the strength, the courage, the might, the confidence, and he has what it takes to restrain himself from sin, then it's better for him to devote his life to ibadat than to engage in marriage. While Imam Abu Hanifa holds a counter view, and he feels that no, you should engage in marriage. We're talking about people who have the ability, and I don't know if they exist in these times. But in terms of academic discussion and theory, this is the view of the great giant Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. Sheikh Abdul Fatta Abu Ghudda, a great scholar who visited our shores in, in, in the 90s. I was a student at the institution and a memory that would live with me and a sight that's indelible and a thing that I will cherish for the rest of my life. And in many of my travels, uh, humble travels to Canada, I had the privilege of meeting with his sons and his grandchildren. One of the great contemporaries of recent time. One of the great giants in the field of hadith. He has written a kitab, Al-Ulama Al-Uzzab. Al-Ladheena Atharu Al-Ilma Ala Al-Ziwaj. Scholars who consciously opted for celibacy, not to get married, and gave preference to the cause of knowledge so that they could diligently serve the cause and they devoted their lives and died in the cause without getting married. When I read that, it makes me tear. Why? Because as an individual perceived to be part of the fraternity of the scholars, and I don't claim to be amongst them, that would be an insult to knowledge. By Allah, if I claim to be amongst them, I will be insulting the honor of knowledge. Read who ulama were. Read who scholars were. To, to think, but by and large the community chooses to associate and assimilate us with them. May Allah make it that on the day of Qiyamah we stand up on their ranks. And you say, these were the people. I share with you two, three people amongst them who lived a modest life, never indulged in the halal, leave alone the haram. And they devoted their life to the deen and they passed on. ومن العلماء العزاب الإمام الزاهد العابد المحدث الفقي الجبل الثقة الرضا عديم النظير في عصره أبو النصر بشر ابن حارث ابن عبد الرحمن المروزي ثم البغدادي المشهور باسم بشر الحافي ولد في مروة سنة 150 ونزل ببغداد وتوطنها قال إبراهيم حربي ما أخرجت بغداد أتم عقلا منه ولا أحفظ للسانه من بشر ما عرف له غيبة لأي مسلم كأن في كل شعرة منه عقلا ولو قسم عقله على أهل بغداد لصاروا عقلا وما نقص من عقله شيء Amongst them was الإمام, the leader, الزاهد, the man who loved the life of abstinence المحدث, the scholar of hadith الجبل الثقة الرضا, a giant عديم النظير في عصره, unparalleled in his time أبو نصر, بشر ابن حارث ابن عبد الرحمن he was born in a place called Marwa in the year 150. He relocated to Baghdad and he made this his place and this became the seat of knowledge for him. Ibrahim Harbi, who was one of his contemporaries, says, Baghdad in its history could not produce a more intellectual and a more learned man than Bishr Hafi. He then counts few of his accolades. A, he never backbited any Muslim in his entire life. I was sharing with my colleagues, Imam Abu Hanifa said, if I was ever to backbite anyone, I would backbite my mother so that she gets my reward. Because when you backbite in, you pass in your reward on. He said, I won't be generous with my reward, but if I have to backbite, rather my mother, she gets my reward. What was the eye of these people? I wouldn't backbite, but if ever, rather my mother. كَأَنَّ فِي كُلِّ شَعْرَةٍ مِّنْهُ عَقْلًا It was as if every strand of his hair, every strand of hair was an independent brain. لَوْ قُسِمَ عَقْلُهُ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَغْدَادِ 
if his intellect was distributed to the residents and the inhabitants of Baghdad, every one of them would have walked out from the intelligent and it wouldn't have decreased his intelligence in any way. Then the youth of today want to, want to idolize the immoral celebrities. Oh Muslim youth, study your history, study your legacy, study the people in your lineage. These were our ancestors. These are our shining stars. We haven't heard of them, leave alone studied them or named our children after them. It is said when Bishr Hafi passed away, Baghdad never seen such a funeral in its history. Whole life devoted to the sciences of Islam. Then he writes, Shaykh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda writes, وَمِنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ الْعُزَّابِ الْإِمَامِ الْحُجَّةِ الْحُجَّةِ المفسر المحدث المقري اللغوي الأديب الشاعر المحقق المدقق جامع العلوم ذو التصانيف المجتهد المطلق أحد أئمة الدنيا علما ودينا وفقها وقد طبقت شهرته الآفاق oh, and I was reading this and I'm just like blown away my Allah where were these people and who were these people my Allah and how they loved you and how you loved them and how close they were to you and how close you were to them, my Allah. Introduce us to that which was their common occurrence, my Allah. Who was this? Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabri. Who hasn't heard of Tafsir al-Tabri? Ask any scholar, devoted his entire life. Who was he? Al-Faqi, a jurist. Al-Muqri, a scholar in Qiraat. Al-Nahwi, an authority in Arabic. Al-Sha'ir, a great prof prolific author prolific author and who had imbibed all the multiple sciences of islam al mujtahid al mutlaq who had the adequate sciences to independently access verdicts and make deductions from quran and hadith waqad tabaqat shuhratuhu al afaq and whose fame went across the continents and across the world and then he also writes there on the strength of imam zahabi who's the famous person in the, in field of hadith and the naqqad imam zahabi rahmatullah alayhi in his tarjuma and abu nasr al sijzi who passed away in the year 444 in mecca uh, hafiz abu ishaq al habban says one day i was sitting at the house of abu nasr al sijzi someone knocks on the door so i was the servant there i stood up and i opened the door for either imra'atun suddenly there is this beautiful woman there i opened the door we were all taken by surprise you and I will wish for that. <laughs> so she came in for Akhraj at Kisan. She opens up a bag and she takes out a thousand dinars. You know, we talk of crispy notes. Thousand, not silver, gold, dinars. And she puts it before the Sheikh. These were great people. We will like say, looks like Allah has accepted my studies <laughs> how Allah is rewarding me rewarding you my brother I'm afraid I have even diluted my tawaf while making Kaaba I abuse my gaze oh my Allah what there isn't a shred of Iman left in my heart my Allah I am attracted to the beauty of woman while performing circumambulation you can go to the Kaaba and boast and brag and speak about how many times you visit. But if you don't restrain your gaze and you don't have modesty in your approach, I ask you, my brother, what have you achieved? Mal Maqsood, sister, what's, what's the wisdom? She said, Tatazawajuni, I'm giving you this money, I want you to marry me. He very modestly gazes down and he says, Sister, La Hajat Alif is Ziwaj. I don't have the need to get married. She said, but Sheikh, I am impressed. I am impressed. I'm obsessed by the profoundness of your knowledge. And I want to drink from the spring of the knowledge Allah has given you. And obviously, I cannot do so because of the gender line. The only way we can break formalities, and this can be a legal endeavor, is that I be wedded to you. And that's my only motivation. So you, we don't have to have conjug conjugal relation. We don't have to consummate. We don't have to share the bed. I will be a female servant to you, but perform the nikah so that it's legal and lawful. I mean, look at the temptation at that level. 
not for haram, for halal. And these were humans and mortals. They had equal aspirations and desires. And then we want to say like, you know what, by nature I'm flammable and she's throwing sparks at me, so I'm erupting into flames. At the gas station they have, you know, please keep fire in that away because it's flammable. Like, Allah has created me flammable. Please stop throwing sparks. He said, La hajata li ilal khidmah. I don't have a need for anyone to serve me. And then he said, Sister, please take the money and leave. She took the money and she walked out. We might tell her, Sister, I think you get lost. Can I show you the place? You know, normally even the navigation loses signal here. The navigation generally doesn't pick up signal. Perhaps can I just walk, walk you back? Luqman Hakim said, oh my son, if desperation calls you to walk behind a lion, do so. But don't ever walk behind a woman. Luqman Hakim said, oh my son, if desperation calls you to walk behind a lion, imshi wara al-asad, wala tamshi wara al-mar'a. If desperation calls you to walk behind a lion, so be it. Heaven knows what circumstances could face you at which jungle on which time. But don't walk behind a woman. When she left, he said, When I left my town and my city, I told everybody I'm going in the pursuit of knowledge and I don't want to dilute my endeavor even with the lawful. I said, I'm going to learn knowledge. That's why I say, my brother, you're saying you're going for Hajj? Are you truly going for Hajj? I'm going to spend 10 days in Mecca. Are you truly going to spend 10 days in Mecca? Remember spirituality coming in from one side, and at the same time, you have a hole of your eyes. It's dripping. It's leaking out. You have the hole of your ears. It's coming out. You have the hole of your tongue. You, 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 you blurting things. So whatever you fill in in the form of worship and fast, there is a leak, there is a leak. So nothing has been retained. Simple example, we can have the most brilliant of ACs on, but if the window is on, or the window is open, the door is open, the desired object, the desired result is not achieved. You've got to block the avenues of outside influence, and then you blow your coal and cool air, and then the atmosphere becomes cool and chilled. But if you have the AC blowing at its highest and optimum, and the doors and the windows are open, it's going to feel like there's no AC on. You could be exerting your nights and your days and you could be doing the rest of it. But if these holes are open, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that AC is not going to have the desired effect. And then in the end, Shaykh Abdul Fattah, after writing, he speaks about many. I just said two, three. He writes a beautiful prayer. فَجَزَاهُمُ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْعِلْمِ وَالدِّينِ وَالْإِسْلَامِ خَيْرَ الْجَزَى وَأَكْرِمْهُمْ هُمْ فِي جِوَارِهِ بِالْحُورِ الْعِينِ مَعَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ May Allah reward these scholars on behalf of the knowledge of Islam, on behalf of Islam, on behalf of the ulama, on behalf of the Muslim ummah in its entirety, with the loftiest of abodes in Jannah. And may He wed them, for verily they are deserving and most deserving for the pure damsels of paradise. Who better... For the woman that the Quran says, developed in their chest, modest in their gaze, hidden pearls. No human has looked at them, leave alone, touch them. Do you know with which hand she will embrace you? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked the Hawa, he said, tell us. He said, Law anna bananam min bananiha bada. Let her finger be exposed and it will outshine the brilliance of the sun. You and I, you know, Sheikh, tell us more, tell us more. Oh, that's great. My brother, my brother, let's be real with life. Let's be real. Grab a bull by its horns, as they say. Tackle the hard issues. When things get tough, the tough get going. Things have become tough, the tough have to get going. What is get going? We have to turn to Allah. Coming back to the incident of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam without losing focus. We said he was a young man. We said he was not married. And then we just digress and, and spoke on this year. <coughs> the third challenge, kana fi surat al-mamluk. His present profile was that of a slave. He was not a slave. But people had wrongly 
imposed the slavery on him. And as a slave, you didn't have to preserve your profile as much as a liberated person had to do. So somehow he had an easier way to slip out into sin, which made him more susceptible to the crime, more susceptible to the crime, more prone to the wrong. Then number four, He was in a foreign place. And when a person is foreign, automatically he becomes somehow relaxes the guard. At home, people are watching, you know, that auntie across the road, that uncle, this one, that one. But when you're at London Heathrow and you walk in at the airport, you're relaxing and you're chilling and you walk in and suddenly, Assalamu alaikum, salam. And where did this salam come from? And, no, I was just browsing here. I thought I'll buy some newspaper. Oh, okay, newspaper. I thought you were looking somewhere else. <laughs> you're off guard. But Allah is watching you, my brother. Allah is watching. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَيْبِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ وَأَسِرُّوا قَوْلَكُمْ أَوْ اجْهَرُوا بِهِ إِنَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقَ ألا يعلم من خلق وهو اللطيف الخبير. The one who created you, won't he know you best? Won't he see you all the times? Is not his eye upon you? Is not his gaze upon you? His watchful eye is there. You cannot veil him, you cannot conceal him, you cannot block him. So Yusuf was in a foreign place. Somehow the guard is a bit relaxed and compromised. Again, that makes him closer to the vice. That makes the challenge that much more daunting. That makes the seduction that much more difficult. Then, وَكَانَتِ الْمَرْأَةُ ذَاتُ مَنْصَبٍ وَجَمَالٍ The woman who seduced him was not an ordinary woman, was not an ordinary simple. It was a woman minister's wife of prominence, of beauty, of status, of recognition. وَالدَّاعِي مَعَ ذَلِكْ أَقْوَى مِنْ دَاعٍ مَنْ لَيْسَ كَذَلِكْ and obviously, and obviously, the challenge that comes from that dimension is far greater. Then, وَكَانَتْ هِيَ الْمُطَالِبَةُ فَيَزُولُ بِذَلِكَ كُلْفَةُ تَعَرُّضِ الرَّجُلِ She initiated it. So when she initiated it, he didn't have to fear rejection. How many a man would not initiate their fantasy out of the fear of rejection? They will harbor their fantasy but fear that I might be rejected, so embarrassment of rejection keeps him back and not the fear of Allah. And hence for that man, there's no reward. He won't have the punishment of the wrong. He won't have the punishment because he didn't do the wrong. But he's not restraining out of the fear of Allah. He's better than the one who indulges. But the ideal is the one who withholds for the pleasure of Allah. The one, the ideal is, you know, the one who, you tell your son, I don't want you to go with that friend. And then you come home, mashallah, my son, I'm so happy to see you. You decided not to go. No, no, he still didn't come. I'm waiting for him. <laughs> oh, no. In the end, the friend didn't come and he didn't go. Are you going to give him the equal pat? Are you going to acknowledge him equally? No. He stayed. I'm happy he didn't go. He won't get the negative influence of that peer pressure. But I'm not all that excited. Because you haven't respected or recognized my sentiments. It's not me who you have honored. Circumstances have kept you back. So Yusuf didn't have the fear to break the ice and approach the woman. She initiated the whole thing. No fear of rejection. Furthermore, وَزَادَتْ مَعَ الطَّلَبَ الرَّغْبَةُ الدَّامَّةُ وَالْمُرَاوَدَةُ الَّتِي يَزُولُ بِهَا ظَلُّ الْإِخْتِبَارُ She had come across in an assertive way. So it was clear she wasn't setting a trap. Because today you don't know, you know, there's so many organizations, they set a trap for you to test the waters, how loyal you are. I mean, what a world are we living in? What a world are we living in, oh my Allah? What more are we going to hear of my Allah? One side people are, ex I was reading an article, person in certain remote parts selling body parts, physical humans are selling their body parts to put a platter of food on their table. And then other people are exploiting and abusing and they as you know amassing more and more. And just look at the imbalances and the gross discrepancies between the poor and the wealthy, between the ruling class and the subjects. Ya Allah, what a discrepancy. Only Qiyamah is going to explain this whole thing. One brother said to me, I said, No, that's the wrong way of saying it, but anyway, 
He says, you know, Sheikh, sometimes I wish like I just want to sit on Qiyamah and on this big screen, I want to have some popcorn and some coffee and watch this whole thing what happened in the world. You know, who killed who and who's done who and who was the victim and who was the victor and was the mother-in-law right or the daughter-in-law was right and was the employer correct? And I said, you know, I want to watch this on this, on this big screen. And I said, my brother, there will be issues for you to answer. يُجَاءُ بِبْنِ آدَمَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كَأَنَّهُ بَذَجْ Bukhari, my Habib Sassam said, you'll appear as a lamb before your Allah. You will be trembling yourself. You're not going to be all structured and massacre and strong and, 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 and bold and loud. You'll be a lamb. You won't even be a sheep. You'll be a baby lamb that will be coming in. That is your position before your Allah. And furthermore, what else did this woman do? Was that that ma'adhalika taghliq al-abwaab. In addition to all this, she shut the doors. وَكَانَتْ فِي مَحَلِّ سُلْطَانِهَا بِحَيْثُ تَعْرِفَ الْمَكَانِ الَّذِي لَا تَنَاهُلُهُ الْعُيُونَ She was in a familiar environment, in her own environment. Sometimes in a foreign place, you don't know the place, she doesn't know the place. The curtain moves, someone blows the horn, the alarm bell rings, immediately there's panic. She was in her familiar environment, so she knew the nooks and the corners. So she was at ease and calm. And she tried to bring that level of calmness onto Yusuf and seduce him, as the Quran said, وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبَوَابَ وَقَالَتْ هَيْتَ لَكْ وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبَوَابَ وَقَالَتْ هَيْتَ لَكْ She shut the doors and I painted the picture. And Yusuf is young and he's single and he's foreign and he's a stranger and she's prominent and she's beautiful and she's assertive and the doors are shut and the man is young and the woman is beautiful. And she said, come on Yusuf, let us indulge. Let's close our eyes for a moment and think, think, Ya my Allah. Ya my Allah, we don't even ask for that situation to get that reward because we know we won't able to live up to it, Allah. We don't, we asking you, my Allah, just let us not face those challenges, Allah. We are too weak to even imagine the thought what would happen to us. He said, Allah forbid, I will never entertain the thought. My Allah has been too kind to me to even imagine disobeying Him. My Allah has been too kind. I'm asking you, what are you short of? That is why one scholar said, you have a peaceful night. You wear an exclusive dress. You live a good home, a wonderful lifestyle. And what's your gratitude? You must your Fajr Salah. That's how you start off your gratitude to Allah. You start off your gratitude by omitting your Fajr prayer. But he restrained himself. And I told you what Allah gave him, the empire, the dominion of Egypt. I want to mention with you a few incidents, inshallah, and then we try and draw it to a close. It is the reign of Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu. He dispatches the Sahaba in a direction. Amongst them was Abdullah ibn Huzafa, radiallahu anhu. They were apprehended and intercepted. The king of that time was told that in the group there is a young man, Abdullah ibn Huzafa, who belongs to the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Abdullah ibn Huzafa radiallahu anhu was summoned and he was brought forward. When he comes forward, the king says to him, I have an option and a proposal to make to you. He said, go for it. He said, أَعْرِضُ عَلَيْكَ أَمْرًا أُشْرِكُكَ فِي مُلْكِ وَسُلْطَانِي You forsake your faith, embrace my creed, and immediately you are half in my empire. Immediately. People give us false hopes and we bow to it. People give us false hopes and we bow to it. We lose the money and we lose our Allah more importantly. I told you my brother, the most exorbitant thing in life is sin. Because why? It costs you, not your health, not your wealth, not your wife. It costs you your Allah. It costs you your Allah. Remember that. Person said, no, but I'm only paying one dollar interest. I said, it's not the number, it's not the amount. It means you and Allah are at war. It's this antagonistic relation you've entered into with your creator that is the painful thing, not the connotations of a dollar. It's not one dollar or two dollars. You are at war with your creator. How can you sleep with peace? How can you toss by night? How can you eat his food? How can you breathe his air? So Abdullah ibn Huzafa said, talk about the possible, don't talk about the impossible. لَوْ أَعْطَيْتَنِي جَمِيعَ مَا تَمْلِكْ وَجَمِيعَ مَا مَلَكَتْهُ الْعَرَبِ 
على أن أرجع عن دين محمد طرفة عين ما فعلت ask me to entertain the thought of forsaking my faith for the duration of the wink of an eye and offer me the luxuries the entire world has I won't accept this as an offer you know in other words he painted an extreme scenario you're talking of what you have I'm saying go more go wide go open go large go macro put the whole world on that side and this side ask me bare minimum entertain the thought of forsaking and I'll say it's not a deal we'll say you know what but in my mind I knew I wasn't going to do it and with that money I can help the poor why can't you help the poor with the money that's in your pocket why can't you help the poor with the money in your pocket make the call today my brother don't clutch onto it don't become obsessed with it nothing is mine shataullah Bukhari rahmatullah alayhi an orator like no orator a public speaker like no public speaker I heard scholars saying he used to comfortably address the audience from Rishat and Fajr in the latter part of his life he had a stroke which affected his speech the most he said my Allah taught me I wasn't speaking my Allah taught me I wasn't I am not here because I want to be here. it's the sheer mercy of my Allah nothing is ours anyway Abdullah ibn Huzafa radiallahu says I will not accept this as an offer the king says okay bring the most beautiful woman Ituni bi malikati jamal al bilad miss world if I may translate that phrase usher her into the room and then leave them for a moment together and the obvious will happen so she's ushered into the room this is a young man he's away from home temptation is at its peak the most beautiful of women is put in front of him she walks into the room and she is told to then undress herself she then gradually undresses herself after a moment of silence there's a loud scream there's an awful cry tasrukh iftahu suddenly everybody dashes opens the door and okay right can we accuse him of rape of advancement of this she comes out and she says words that made me cry when I read it I read it in the writings of Ibn Jawzi rahmatullahi she said wallahi ma yadri adhakarun ana am untha wa wallahi ma adri adkhaltumuni ala basharin am ala hajar by Allah this man doesn't know if I'm a male or I'm a female and by Allah, I don't know if he's a human or a stone. By Allah, this man doesn't know if I am a male or a female. We will know what nationality she is. You can just see from her nose. You can see she looks like, yeah, from her hands you can see she's in veil, but you can see she's young. My brother, my brother. Have I only got this venom throwing out from my eyes? Have I only got this poison going out from my eyes? I cry sometimes to my Allah and I talk to Allah. Oh my Allah, when will my life change? Oh my Allah, when will my attitude change? Oh my Allah, when will it be that a sister passes by and I don't harbor a nasty thought? Oh my Allah, when will it be that I don't have a fantasy for the woman across the road? Oh my Allah, if this woman who comes so modestly clad and speaks to me, asking an aspect of deen, if you have to unveil to her how dirty my heart is, perhaps the earth will split and swallow her if she has to know how evil I am, my Allah. By Allah, he knows not if I'm a male or a female, and I know not if he's a human or a stone. The king says, okay, we'll kill him. So two innocent sahaba are brought prisoners, a pot of oil is burnt and they are hurled in and they are burnt and then Abdullah ibn Huzafa is taken as he's going he starts crying so the things the king says okay looks like now we've got him thinking and he's changed his mind bring him back he's brought back you're crying change of mind he said my Allah gave me such pleasure in obeying him now what did I say you do it and then you see the pleasure the excitement the happiness the ultimate is just not to obey your creator but to cherish his obedience that's it my brother you bring me a glass of water he pulls his face up and he goes and he brings it 
and the other one doesn't bring and then you admonish him and he says dad but I brought it yeah but honestly with the attitude that you brought it maybe if you didn't bring it I would have been better my brother I'm asking you with what attitude do you get up for Fajr with what attitude do you fast do you think you're doing my Allah a favor how can you impress my Allah by abstaining from food when he never eats how can you impress my Allah by abstaining from drinks when he never drinks? How can you impress my Allah? He's only trying to help you to get you closer to your paradise. Oh my boy, how much must I impress upon you? Your studies, your nobility, your character is to make better of you and there's nothing for me. And the son says, no, no, you want it, but I'm telling you it's for you. And this conflict of interest and he just till he doesn't cross that hurdle the antagonism continues and the day the boy realizes and reality dawns and maturity sets in that I'm doing it for my own interest now he's motivated by his own agenda my Allah says my sovereignty is at its greatest punishing you can't make me greater Punishing you can't make me greater. But if you choose to be stubborn, and if you choose to be obstinate, then even the Prophet said, How do I lament the fate of a nation who chooses to deny? You tell him, listen, he says, no. You tell him, listen, no. Then there's consequences. Now you want me to cry. How do I cry when he chose to disobey? You tell the boy, don't run, you're going to get hurt. No, no, I'm okay. My baby, you're going to get, no, I'm okay. And when he gets hurt, what is it? Good. You learned. That's what you're going to say. So he said, I, I am crying, not because I'm going to be burnt, but I'm crying that I'm feeling so close to my Allah, and I honestly wish I had multiple lives. I could lay them down one after the other, but I feel sad that I don't have more. And I can relate with this sometimes for your partner, you're having a good moment and you know, you're flying overseas and she says, buy me this. And you say, that's fine. And then uh, how much is it? It's a thousand dollars. Oh, leave it. My darling, my beloved, wallahi, even if it's a thousand pounds without twitching my eye, without frowning for you, I will do it. And trust me, if it was 10,000 pounds, if I had it, I would put it down. It's not the money. It's just to make you happy. We have these moments in our relation. The pious had it with their Allah. My Allah, I only have one life. Had this man asked more and you favored me with multiple, I wouldn't have winked my eye. I would have laid them one after the other. I would have laid them. We haven't been introduced to this. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, Abdul Salam ibn Shaddad says, I heard from Ghazwan ibn Jarir, who says, I heard from, his, from my father, and he says, one day we were sitting with Ali radiallahu anhu, and then the topic of immorality started. The nafs, the ego, the carnal desires. So Ali radiallahu anhu said, Ala ukhbirukum bi zina Allah. Should I not tell you of the most worst form, the most despicable, the most deplorable, the most detestable sin? In zina. So we said, but Ali, would it not be correct to say every form of zina is deplorable? He said, yes, but one is worse than the other. Now, before I tell you this here, I must share with you how the devil misleads everyone. The devil has a different ploy, but he traps everyone. So one brother came to me once. He said, you know, Sheikh, I've got this bad habit. My gaze roams. But one thing is for sure. I will never look at a non-Muslim woman. I only look at Muslim women. And I always tell myself, I look at, like, you know, someone that I could potentially get married to. So, astaghfirullah, I don't justify that, but I have that degree of discipline in me. I wouldn't want to cast a lustful gaze on a non-Muslim woman, but I say, rather, I'm doing a wrong, but better off with a Muslim sister. And by Allah, this is not a thumbsack. I'm telling you what had happened. Another brother came to me. He said, you know, Sheikh, I have this bad problem, and you need to advise me. But I always feel, I said, why must I cast a dirty glance at our Muslim pure sisters? I rather look at a non-Muslim woman and you know Allah must forgive me for my wrong but I say no this is not right to our Muslim I said subhanallah the devil is playing tricks and clapping hands 
He got this one hooked here. He got that one hooked here. And this one is appeasing himself. I'm not all that bad. I'm not all that bad. So like how, how often, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to backbite anyone, but I'm just saying. Are you just saying what? You're backbiting. Look here, it's not here to badmouth anyone. Astaghfirullah, I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm better. It's not a holier than thou attitude. But just as discussion, you know, that, uh, that brother is really amazing. He's wicked. What's that, my brother? You are sugarcoating it. So today, if you look at all your pediatric medicine, everything is sugarcoated. The child wants the sweetened medicine. That's what you do. It's the same thing. But what happens is when you sweeten it, it compromises. The more bitter, the better. The more bitter, the better. That's what we know and what we learn. So I said, the devil got him trapped this way. The devil got him trapped this way. There is no change. The Prophet ﷺ is in Mina. Fadl ibn Abbas, his cousin, the brother of Abdullah ibn Abbas is mounted on. A woman from the Khath'am tribe comes. She was a woman, young and beautiful. And she comes to ask a question to the Prophet ﷺ. So Nabi Sassim took the neck of Fadl ibn Abbas, Lawa Anuq al Fadl, and said, Fadl, look that way. So Abbas radiallahu was present. Oh, Nabi of Allah, Lawaita Anuq al Fadl, you turn him like this. My Habib وسلم, said, Raaitu Shabban wa Shabbatan, falam amun alayhim al Shaytan. I seen a young man and a young woman common at one venue. I did not consider them immune from the devilish influence. I am saying Allah's Nabi is present. It's Hajjatul Wada. It is the combination of nobility to perfection. There couldn't be a better venue, a better person, a better thing. And today the slogan is our hearts are clean. Our hearts are clean. I don't have evil intentions. My brother, you can sit by fire and maybe not get burned, but you'll feel the heat. You will feel the heat. And one day you'll be burnt. Anyway, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said, Inna a'dama zina inda Allah an yazni rajul bi zawjati rajul al-Muslim. The worst form of zina is that you make zina with a Muslim married sister. He said that's the worst form of zina. Why? You're supposed to be a guardian to her protection. You're supposed to be protecting and safeguarding her. You've violated the boundaries of protection. You've showed no regard to that. And on the reverse, you've perpetrated the offense. And then the Prophet and then Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said, Inna nasa yursalu alayhim yawm al qiyamati rihun. On the day of Qiyamah, this foul smell will be unleashed on the occupants of hell. Allah save us. And it would be so, so unpleasant that it would become unbearable. They will block their nose. Suddenly a person will call out and say to them, Hal tadruna ma hadhihi rih allati adatkum. Do you people know where this foul smell is coming from? They will say, no, we don't know. Illa annaha qad balagat minna kulla mablag. But it has really hurt us and we cannot bear it any longer. Then Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said it would be said to them, Ala innaha rihu furuj is zunad. Alladheena laqu allaha bi zinahum wa lam yatubu minhu. This is the foul smell from the five private organs of the males and the females who indulged in zina. And this is causing this discomfort that every dweller of hell will hate them because of this pain. Two incidents, inshallah, and some concluding advices. Ibn Tawzi rahmatullah makes mention of a man. He was walking, one about a pious woman and one about a pious man. We are living in an atmosphere of sin and vice, immorality. How do we address the issue? How do we move on forward practically? Anyway, this man is walking and suddenly his gaze falls on a woman. He is drawn towards her like a magnet. I don't think you have to explain that. It happens more than often. He couldn't contain himself, so he decided to put pen to paper. And when a man wants to praise a woman, your wife will tell you what you said to her. On the reverse, one of my scholars used to say, when does a woman praise her husband? Two times. One is before she's married to him. <laughs> you know who I'm getting married to? You know who I'm getting married to? He's the dean of the faculty at that tertiary institution. You know that prominent scholar? I'm getting married to him. She praises him before she gets married. And the next time she praises him, when his funeral leaves the house. Your father was a great man. Your dad was a great man. 
My sister said to him when he's alive, don't spare the praise. We have become a nation. It takes the death of people for us to acknowledge them. وَلَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ يُوسُفُ مِنْ قَبْلُ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ فَمَا زِلْتُمْ فِي شَكٍّ مِمَّا جَاءَكُمْ بِهِ حَتَّى إِذَا هَلَكَ قُلْتُمْ لَنْ يَبْعَثَ اللَّهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ رَسُولًا You know, I have this, brothers, when I'm reading Quran, I'm, I'm a wicked man, and I'm not saying this here to generate any acknowledgement. I know my sins, I know my sins, and I know... And it's just the mercy of Allah. And I ask Allah by His kindness not to deny me and deprive me of what He's given me because of my vice. But I always identify with one quotation of Abdullah ibn Abbas. Anhu. He said, Inni la'ati ala al-aya fa'awaddu law anna al-nasa jami'an alimu mithla alladhi a'lam. He said, I'll be studying an ayah and I get so engrossed in this ayah that I have this desire I wish the whole world could join me today in this lesson of this ayah and equally could see the depth of this verse like how I'm seeing it. And really sometimes when I'm studying in the late hours of the night and I am, I'm, I'm, I'm so engrossed in it and I enjoy it by Allah so much and I say, Ya Allah, I look out of the window, it's late, it's 11, it's 12 and it's dark and all is sleeping. And I say, Ya Allah, I wish I could scream out to the world. I wish I could scream out to the world what you have said in this ayah. <laughs> حَتَّى إِذَا هَلَكَ قُلْتُمْ لَنْ يَبْعَثَ اللَّهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ رَسُولًا كَذَلِكَ يُضِلُّ اللَّهُ مَنْ هُوَ مُسْرِفٌ مُرْتَابٌ 24 Jews, Surah Mu'min, the pious believer, Rajulun Mu'min, his qeel according to narrations, he said to the people, when Yusuf was present, then you didn't value him. But when he went on, and this is mentioned in the footnotes of Tafsir Uthmani, you said, we will never see a man like him again. You will never see a human like him. The point that is mentioned in the footnotes of Tafsir Uthmani, it took the death of the man for you to treasure him. So we were just talking on, on that note where, you know, unfortunately praising a man before you married, and post his death. We need to share kind words while we're living. We need to, and if we start sharing kind words to one another, then we won't walk out of our house hungry for the praises of the opposite gender. So when a sister passes a comment to me, I'll feel offended. I'm married. What do you mean? And when somebody makes an advancement to my sister, my sister will say, back off. I'm married and my husband, I'm beautiful to my husband. That's good enough. But the problem is I'm not telling my wife and she's not telling me. So we are going out as thirsty and hungry people. And then we're feeling flattered and inflated and acknowledged by one polite smile, which is also diluted and polluted with some other agendas. Today in the corporate world, how common a slogan that a woman has to sleep her way up to promotion. It's a sad reality. In, in the corporate world, a woman has to, on the global stage, on the macro level, it's not skill and competence. And then, and then with a forked tongue, with a forked tongue, we want to talk of empowering women, liberating women, yet we're enslaving them for our passions and desires. And we're subjecting them to promotion on these grounds. We, we differentiate in monetary returns. And with a forked tongue, we want to chant the slogans of liberating and empowering women. Oh my Lord, what a sick society have we entered into, my Allah. Open our eyes, O oh my Allah, that we see the truth as correct and the sin as incorrect. So anyway, he's seen this woman, and long story short, he decided to put pen to paper. And he dropped her her note. Today you'll drop her an SMS. What did he say? قَدْ كُنْتُ أَحْسِبُ أَنَّ الشَّمْسَ وَاحِدَةٌ وَالْبَدْرَ فِي مَنْظَرٍ بِالْحُسْنِ مَوْسُوفُ حَتَّى رَأَيْتُكِ فِي أَثْوَابٍ ثَاكِلَةٍ سُودٍ وَصُدْغُكِ فَوْقَ الْخَدِّ مَعْتُوفُ 
فرحت والقلب مني هائم دنف والكبد حرا ودمع العين مذروف رد الجواب ففيه الشكر واغتنمي وصل المحب الذي بالحب مشغوف I don't want to elaborate time is up now and you know much has been said long story short he says you know all my life I believe there was only one sun and one moon till I seen you all my life I believe there was only one sun that rises and one moon Till my gaze fell on you and I find that you simultaneously embody the sun and the moon. Wow. Wow. A man, when he wants to thrill. Hatta ra'aytuki until I seen you. Fi athwabin thakilatin. Clad in your beautiful choice of clothes. Wa sudhuki fawq al khaddi ma'tufu. And to compliment your beauty, that smile on your forehead, I was literally blown away. فَرُحْتُ I moved on وَالْقَلْبُ مِنِّي هَائِمٌ But my heart stayed behind. My heart stayed behind. Many of our hearts are overseas roaming. They never got back from that business trip to China. I'm going for business. What business? Not your business. Okay. 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 I'm going for business. What? Not your business. All right. Okay, brother. My brother... Wallahi al-Azim, Wallahi al-Azim, Wallahi al-Azim. If you went and you made zina, and you made five containers, and you made five hundred thousand dollars, nay, add more zeros and make it millions, that wealth is bereft of goodness, it's devoid of barakat, because all that money caused one zina in your life. Caused one zina in your life. Love hand to mouth and meet your creator with a pure life. My heart stayed behind and uh, I couldn't detach from you. So please respond. I anticipate your prompt reply, your prompt reply. And I look forward to a positive response. I'm really infatuated over you. The reason why I said this was not to, to give you a light moment and to thrill you, but rather to tell you the answer of the sister. And may Allah make that the answer of my sister. Allah forbid that any male makes an advancement to her. But this is the answer of our great woman of history. She said, In kunta dha hasabin zakin wa dha nasabin inna sharifa bi ghaddi tarf ma'roofu inna zunata unasun la khalaqa lahum inna zunata unasun la khalaqa lahum fa'lam bi annaka yawm ad-deen mawqoofu وقطع رجاك لحاك الله من رجل فإن قلبي عن الفحشاء مصروف. She said, "Oh brother, your apparent appearance suggests piety. Your appearance suggests piety, and in harmony with your appearance, the right thing would have been that your gaze is low. إن الشريف بغض الطرف معروف. You should know better. I could give you the moment, spare you the time, and we could indulge." But those who commit zina are bereft of all goodness and happiness, and they never see bliss and joy in their family or their children. Wa'alam, waqta arajak, terminate your false fantasies. Abandon your false hopes. Oh my Allah, let these hopes die today. Say Ameen. Oh my Allah, let these false aspirations dwindle and never reoccur, my Allah. Oh my Allah, what wrong have I done? And yes, I have done, my Allah, too much wrong because of which I have become a vessel of care and filth in my heart, my Allah. Oh my Allah, clean this heart, purify this heart so that your countenance can descend in this heart, so that your nur can empower this heart, my Allah. So with my eye, I see your greatness. With my ear, I hear your greatness. With my tongue, I glorify your greatness, oh my Allah. وقطع رجاك لحاك الله من رجل فإن قلبي عن الفحشاء مصروف ما هات is averted from sin. It hit him and he says a young girl she's more conscious of Allah than you and he felt embarrassed. He gave up a life of sin. He then obeyed Allah and he was making tawaf one day clad in a simple garb. And here the sister is making tawaf and she sees him. I often tell people you know people say I'm suffering from Alzheimer's and I'm forgetting things very quickly. But today, people have selective Alzheimer's also. You owe me money, I forgot completely. Assalamu alaikum. Who are you greeting? She was with me in school 30 years ago. What a memory, my brother. What a memory. 
But you said now, last week we struck a deal and you forgot you owed me money a week ago. My word, this girl has matured and she's a mother of two and you were together in grade three and your eye made a spot on recognition. I call it selective Alzheimer's. Who are we thrilling? Who are we thrilling? What a memory, 30 years ago, we were in kindergarten together and yes, spot on. How's life? You married? Oh, that's nice. That's your little one. That's so sweet. Marshall, who you got married? Oh, you got married to him. Good, good, good. I always think of you. <laughs> oh, my Allah changed my life. Oh, my Allah changed my direction. Oh, my Allah changed my vision. Oh, my Allah, let my eyes open. Oh my Allah, let me not die like this, my Allah, let me not die like this. Can the dynamics of my prayer change from tonight? 80% of my dua is he owes me and I owe him and I want this and I want that. And in the tail end, there's a bit of spiritual needs that are just blended in and the dua is wrapped up. Can I start off with my spiritual needs, make that the focus and the be all and in the end just bring in whatever material needs I have. Allah, I am living on this world and I have to love. And I have certain needs and necessities and amenities. And I ask of you to sustain and preserve and protect. Can I, can, can I change the dynamics of my prayer? So he's making tawaf, she's making tawaf. She spots him clad in the simple clothes. She says, Hallaka fil mabah. Brother, I'm ready to get married to you. Would halal nikah be an option? He said, sister, that was an option before I was introduced to the beauty of Allah. Now that I've tasted that, haram and halal, I'm clean from both. قَدْ كُنْتُ أَرُومُ ذَلِكْ قَبْلَ أَنْ أَعْرِفَ اللَّهَ وَأُحِبَّهُ وَالْآنْ قَدْ شَغَلَنِي حُبَّهُ عَنْ حُبِّ غَيْرِهِ So she said, that's great. I'm at the Kaaba. I won't speak a lie. I didn't want to get married to you. I was impressed to see your piety. And the only motivation of my question was to ascertain your spiritual level. I wanted to say, in your stage of climbing, where were you? And I'm great to know you reach in heights. And that's so great. And then she said, Fatufna fala had fit tawafi lawa ihu. Fatufna fala had fit tawafi lawa ihu. Rani na biha an kulli maran wa masma'i. We were making tawaf. And I was engrossed in the greatness of my Allah. And he was engrossed in the magnanimity of Allah. Suddenly we made eye contact. And there was a bit of recognition, but then we were oblivious of one another because we both were consumed in the beauty of Allah. Because we both were consumed in the beauty of Allah. Oh my Allah, give that to me as well. This was the beauty of a young girl, flip the coin and a young man. So there was this woman, very beautiful. Ibn Jawzi makes mention of Ubaid ibn Umair's incident. She was living in Mecca. She was very beautiful, impressive. One day she came home, she looked at herself in the mirror. And she had a light moment with her husband. She said, darling, do you think any man will look at me and not be attracted to me? Women feel bad if people don't say she's beautiful. She's so nasty. She couldn't even say my clothes are mashallah. And she feels like she's been, you know, victimized or she wasn't. So you've got to pet her. And look at, look at, look at, we learn from the lives, Hayatul Sahaba. Abu Bakr radiallahu sees his daughter Aisha radiallahu looking in the mirror. She was a woman, she was a young girl. I said, I read an article in Western Australia. They did a survey on girls at the age of six. And those girls said they are not happy with their figures. Girls at the age of six, I thought they played mummy, mummy. That's what I knew girls in the neighborhood at the age of six are playing. And it's a doll and a bottle and a pram and going and running and a diaper and all that. What a sick society, my Allah. Oh my Allah, who do we turn to but you? Aisha radiallana is having a moment. She's looking at the mirror. She's just seen herself. Abu Bakr radiallana said, Aisha, I don't know what you are admiring because my Allah is not admiring you. Ma tanzurina ya Aisha fa inna Allah laysa binadirin ilayk. Allah is not admiring you. Why, oh my dad? 
Because when a person clads themselves with a new garment and they feel proud and obsessed and impressed and exclusive and elevated and superior, مَقَتَهُ رَبُّهُ حَتَّى يُفَارِقَ تِلْكَ الزِّينَةِ and then Allah shuns that individual until he or she doesn't shun that dress and attitude. Immediately Aisha radiallahu anha took out that dress and gave it in charity. Immediately. Our woman cannot give it even after the new one comes. At least the cupboard looks nice. The hangers must match. I got all my blue cloaks one side. I went to one brother's house, he sent me for, I went to a program, so I stayed at his house, and then he told me to use his master bedroom. Wallahi, I cried. And I went in there, and I, I thought it was a shoe shop. I thought it was a shoe shop. He, he, I guess he meant good to give me his best bedroom. And he didn't want to expose me, or he didn't think much of it. But I made a dua in my heart, and I do this whenever I go. I say, Allah, wherever I go, people host me with the best of kindness and I have nothing. But they respect the appearance of knowledge. Allah, my prayer is not give them more money, give them deen, Allah. Give them iman, Allah. Bring their children to you, Allah. I'm not here to make dua for their wealth and that. They show me this respect on the appearance of deen. I don't have it, but it's a, it's a shape that you have hosted me and acknowledged me and respected and revered me. Those who had it are elsewhere and they have moved on. The Arabic poet said, قَدْ ذَهَبَ النَّاسُ وَمَاتَ الْكَمَالُ وَصَاحَ صَرْفُ الدَّهْرِ أَيْنَ الرِّجَالُ هَذَا أَبُوْ الْعَبَّاسِ فِي نَعْشِهِ قُومُوا فَانْذُرُوا كَيْفَ تَسِيرُ الْجِبَالُ When Abu al-Abbas was a great person passed away, someone said, قَدْ ذَهَبَ النَّاسُ The prominent people have gone. وَمَاتَ الْكَمَالُ And perfection has moved on. Even the time called out, where are the humans? Where are the humans? The reply came, here are they in the coffins and here are they in the graves. Stand up and see how giants and mountains are relocated to cemeteries. So anyway, she came home, she asked her husband, do you think any? He said, of course, I know of a man by the name of Ubaid ibn Umar. He will never fall prey to your beauty. He said, give me the chance, I will mislead him. I will end on this, inshallah. He said, go, you have my permission. He leaves, she leaves. He had a discourse in the Haram Sharif. She comes in the Haram. She says, Sheikh, can I have a moment with you, please? I need to ask you something. So that's fine. Goes to the corner there. She unveils herself. Absolute beauty. Absolute beauty. So he drops his gaze. says, Sister, please, please. Can you kindly conceal yourself? She said, Inni qad futin to big. I'm infatuated over you. He said, okay. Okay. I want to have a moment with you. Sheikh said, okay, no problem. Three questions. You answer it. And then I will, I will look into your request. He said, oh, no problem, my darling. We would say, I was about to tell her no, but when she said, darling, I melted, man. <laughs> ya Allah, I, you know, I, I just felt that she was so polite. My brother, remember my words. You're either walking out from this gathering with a drug or a gambling habit or a woman or your Allah. You can't walk with both. You cannot walk with both. You either having a thrill or pure happiness. You either having an excitement or wholesome bliss. You either excited for the moment and happy for the rest of your life. Thrilled for the occasion and overwhelmed for the rest of your life. Decide what you want. This is the call. Apply your mind. You tell your son, these are the perks and the luxuries you enjoy. I need performance from you in academics and Islamic studies. It cannot be that you don't perform and you enjoy the perks. If you don't perform, you toil, you labor, you earn, you provide for yourself. But if you show me results, all is done. All is taken care of. And without stress, we tell our children, all we want is do your thing and I'll take care of the rest of it. Long story short, she says, answer three questions. She says, okay, no problem. Number one, لو جاء ملك الموت ليقبض روحك أكان يسرك أني قضيتها لك Sister, let's forward time. Let's speed it up. Let's fast forward it and bring it to the moment of death. And here's the angel of death knocking your door. And here you have your records. Would you like your records to carry the demerit and the sin of zina that I had done with you here? And now it's the moment of death. Just, just fast forward things. She said, Allahumma la, no, no, never, never, never. Allah forbid. Allah forbid. Allah forbid. This morning, we were there in the hotel. And mashallah, the brothers suggested that we just have a little massage. 
And I got chatting with the brother and I started speaking. And wallah, as I was lying on the bed and my hands were there, and he put my hands on the side, I thought to myself, that will also happen when my body will be lying one day. My corpse will be lying. Today I'm consciously being told, put your hands on the side, lie flat, look down, leave it like this, breathe in, breathe out. But the day is sure to come, my Allah. The day is sure to come that my hands will be on my side. Some will be crying, some will be shocked, some will be disturbed, some will be consoling, others will... They say the graveyard is a silent place with a loud message. The graveyard is a silent place with a loud message. Would you like it that I have committed this? No, not at all. Second question. لو أدخلت قبرك وأجلست للمجلس مسألة. You are lowered into your grave. The angels appear. Reckoning commences. Would you like to know that you have committed this act? Allahumma la, never, never. Third question. Ji abik. You appear before Allah and your scales are brought. Would you like that on your evil scales this is carried? She said, no. He said, listen now, sister. Ittaqillah. Fear Allah. You're a good woman coming from a noble house. Allah has favored you with everything. Don't throw your na'mats away. Don't abandon what Allah has given you. Preserve your relation. Fear Allah and change your life. She comes back. The husband says, what happened? Did he fall prey? She says, anta battal wa nahnu battalun. My husband, you're wasting your life and I'm wasting my life. فَأَقْبَلَتْ عَلَى الصَّلَاةِ وَالصَّوْمِ وَالْعِبَادَةِ And then she devoted her entire life to worship and piety and virtue. And the husband used to even say, now what happened to Ubaid ibn Umair? My wife used to be a, a bride for me every night. She's now become a monk. I just told her that, you know what, he won't fall prey. But now suddenly she's not making hello to me also. She's changed the whole focus of her life. These are my last two words to you. And I say it to you because you have studied the fiqh of al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. I pray for him so much that you possibly know not because I am one of the most fond people of his poetry and his advisors. He said, Sahib to Sufiya. I stayed with many pious. And I had the company of learning and drawing from the knowledge of great giants. And I can summarize all my knowledge and my information and my wisdom that I've acquired from all the pious in two words. Oof. Just the thought alone gives you a shiver and makes your hair stand. A man like a shafii who left a legacy, who left a school of thought, who authored 200 books, who was one of the poetic people of his time, he said, I sat with them all, I learned from them all. I summarized my stay with all the scholars to two words. Number one, al-waqtu sayfun. Al-waqtu sayfun. In qata'atahu aw qata'ak. Time is a sword. Either you cut it or it chops you. Time is a sword. Time is a sword. It's going, my brother. It is going. It's happening. It's moving. Yes, the year has turned. And we see the, the presence of a new Ramadan. Yes, I'm over the 30 mark. And for some, I'm over the 40 mark. And for some, I'm, am I a grandfather? Am I a father? Has this happened? Has this boy shot up? Yes, it has happened. The first thing I learned, time is a sword. Either you cut it or it chops you. And number two, وَنَفْسُكْ إِنْ شَغَلْتَهَا بِالْحَقِّ أَوْ شَغَلَتْكَ بِالْبَاطِلِ Either you engage it in Allah's obedience, or then it engages you in Allah's disobedience. Either you say, I'm reading Quran, or then your ego says, I'm going on the net. Either you say, I glorify Allah, or then your ego says, I'm popping a pill. But there is no in-between. Either you engage in it, or it is engaging you. That is the harsh reality. Someone said it very beautifully on the note of time. The past is history. The past is history. The future is a mystery. The present is a gift. That's why they call it a present. Why do they say it's present tense? Why? Because it's a present. It's a present. Nature has given you a present. You are walking out here, my brother. We say as you leave out, there will be a gift bag. Make sure to collect your gift bag. There will be a complimentary voucher. There will be a CD. Walk out with your gift bag. And it's a gift given to you by Allah. And what do the world call it? They call it the present tense. Why do they call it the present? Because it's a present. As they say, aspire 
to inspire before you expire. Wa akhir ta'wana alhamdulillah.